Today is December 22nd, 2020, and my guest is author Gary Schiffman of Georgetown University. He is CEO of two firms, Giant Oak and Consilient. Those firms use machine learning to help people deal with risk. Our topic for today is his new book, The Economics of Violence, How Behavioral Science Can Transform Our View of Crime, Insurgency, and Terrorism. I want to let parents know there may be some adult or disturbing themes in today's episode. I want to encourage listeners to go to econtalk.org for our annual survey of your favorite episodes. Gary, welcome to Econ Talk. Ross, it's really great to be with you. Thanks very much. First, tell us a little about your career and how you came to write this book. Yeah, it's a, a, an unusual uh, background for an economist, perhaps. I started my career in the U.S. military, um, in the Navy. My first job out of college, I like to say, was the Gulf War, if you remember that a long time ago. Um, and so just uh, traveled around the world, uh, saw conflict, saw coercion, saw violence, um, came back to uh, the United States after being overseas for my first four years out of college. Um, I worked in the Pentagon. I worked in the United States Senate as a national security advisor uh, to the, the Republican leadership in the Senate. I worked on issues such as um, uh, um, terrorism and peace talks and, and topics like that. And at that point, I started my uh, PhD work at George Mason University in economics. And so I came into economics with a, with a mission and the mission was to make sense of the world. Um, I had started my academic career in um, uh, my master's degree at Georgetown where I now teach. Um, and I learned a lot of political science and IR theory and to be honest- International I relations. International relations and um, I was uh, incredibly disappointed. I was, uh, I was, you know, uh, young and eager to change the world, and I was so excited to be at an elite um, institution. And and IR theory just didn't answer any questions for me. It didn't, it didn't click. It didn't make sense. It wasn't the world that I had just come, uh, you know, spent eight years traveling around and seeing. It didn't work. Um, and coincidentally, I uh, met for coffee with a young economist named Tyler Cowen. And um, and told him that you know uh, uh, Adam Smith made sense to me and um, Hans Morgenthau did not and uh, Tyler said welcome welcome to our community <laughs> uh, and uh, so I pursued the PhD in economics with the idea of understanding conflict and violence and coercion in the world um, and uh, and so my career since then has been the combination of of economics and uh, real-world application in the national security space. So, how do we how do we make us safer and more secure, or maybe better stated, how do we make the world more difficult for people who want to do bad things? And um, and really, an, a focus on on changing the world and doing things with um, with real operational impact in the world but really leveraging and leaning on the academic disciplines uh, that are available to us as practitioners. And for me, you know, my bias is, is in economics, um, but I'm open, to, you know, I'm open to any sort of science that helps us make sense of the world. And, and my, my default and go-to is, is economics. Sometimes I describe myself as a behavioral scientist, uh, sometimes as an e economist, but... Um, it, it's this idea of understanding um, these complex problems. And the reason I like economics is because it is a science of human decision making. And, and if you think about national security, it is fundamentally a human problem, right? We don't have wars but for people, um, at, least, at least up till 2020. So it's really about understanding human behavior to have an impact in the world. Yeah, I think that I think the key question is, is, you know, what is the role of rationality and how do more importantly, how do we think about rationality? Yeah. Uh, because that word is a bit of a suitcase word, a word that you can stuff a lot of things into. Um, your book has three case studies. We'll, we may get to them in de more detail, but you look at Pablo Escobar, Joseph Kony and Osama bin Laden, who on the surface are a criminal, 
a drug dealer, a criminal, an insurgent, and a terrorist. And yet you you make the point, I think, throughout the book that they kind of all three of them are all three at the same time. And and that maybe the standard ways we label people and the ways that we describe their motivation by their some purported uh, motivator, religion, um, money, et cetera, may be missing the, the fuller picture. So our, our goal today is to, is to, I'm gonna let you try to convince us that that's a better way to look at it than the standard way. And, and occasionally I'm gonna agree with you that there may be times I disagree. Uh, I wanna start with a quote, uh, you, you write, quote, you, you say that you have, quote, grown skeptical of many popular theories of non-state organized violence, non-state organized violence. For example, again, quoting you, I question policies based on slogans such as radical Islam and other national or religious identities. Instead, I've come to appreciate science-based approaches to national security, particularly those based on social science and economics. So what's wrong with thinking about, say, terrorism as, as a religious issue? Uh, sometimes it's it's a, uh, a political issue. Uh, it's not motivated just by religion. It can be motivated by ideology, obviously. But that's the standard way people talk about it uh, in the press and in, in the halls of Congress. W why is that? What's wrong with that? Russ, thanks for leading with that question. I think that the lang language matters. And I think that our propensity to l label groups of people by some identity marker is lazy and inaccurate. So I'm, I'm going to, you know, state that very strongly. Um, and as, a, as an economist, you know, we might say that, uh, I might restate that to say we're confusing correlation with causation. So, um, you know, the, the world, you know, 25% of the world is, is Muslim and there are not that many Islamic terrorists. So the fact that we attribute uh, Islam with terrorism um, is just plain inaccurate. I mean, it's an over, grossly oversimplification. Um, and we tend to do that because it, it allows us to make categorizations that are easy to understand and digestible, um, but not necessarily correct. And I think that's the main goal of this book is to really address this question is, do these identity labels help us to understand the phenomena that we care about in the world, such as terrorism, insurgency, and drug trafficking, um, or do they mislead us? And I'm arguing in this book that they're, they're mostly misleading um, and that there is a better way, and the better way is to think, about, um, to think about markets, to think about humans and institutions and markets and firms and prices and entrepreneurs. And if we pivot from that's a drug dealer, that's an insurgent, that's a Muslim, that's a Mexican. If we get rid of those terms and we say that's a firm, that's an entrepreneur, we can simplify the story, we can make sense of it, and I think it's more accurate. Okay, we're going to get to that. I, I'm not, uh, I, I want to take one more step back though, and I, and I love uh, this, my, one of my favorite parts of the book, not directly related to, to violence, but um, uh, you, you talk about Robinson Crusoe, who's alone on, a, on an island. Yeah. You say, what happens to Crusoe if another person, whom we will call Friday, appears on the island? We know that humans seek to barter and trade with other humans to better their situation. If we placed a wild boar on the island, Crusoe would likely hunt the boar and roast it for dinner. But it would be absurd to posit that Crusoe would hunt Friday and roast him for dinner. Why is that? And I think that's, you know, I've never heard that example. It's a beautiful, um, uh, I have a different take <laughs> version of that, <laughs> not as dramatic, but yeah. it's a fantastic point that the arrival of Friday doesn't make Crusoe poorer, for starters, right. and that eating him would be a mistake, a tactical error. Why? And, and the fact that he, he just intuitively knows that to be the case. This is this idea, and I, and I you know, know you're an, an Adam Smith aficionado as well, but um, you know, we, we have this, this fundamental human nature, which 
is uh, described or maybe summarized by the propensity to truck barter and exchange one thing for another. So no matter where I am in the world today, as, as I travel around uh, literally or, or just you know, reading the paper in the morning, or if I look back through any point in history, um, if I can go back to this idea that every character that I'm seeing in this, in this plot that I'm witnessing has the propensity to truck barter and exchange, then that's a, that's a scientific principle from which I can launch into my analysis and say, well, why are people killing each other? Why is this person, you know, uh, coercing these other people? Um, and just go back to this fundamental idea that there's a propensity to truck barter and exchange. And I like the Robinson Crusoe story because it's a very simple way of making the point that that as, as a reader and you read that passage that you just read out loud, you know it's true. You know that Robinson Crusoe didn't think, hey, there's like two days worth of food. Robinson Crusoe knew that this is an opportunity to truck barter and exchange one thing for another. Cooperate. This, or this cooperate. Would, it doesn't have to be, obviously, in this case, it doesn't have to right. be literal um, truck barter and exchange. If there so, were 20 people, it would be maybe. But. Right. Um, well, Right. Well, with two people, as you said, uh, th there's this assumption that they could be better off. Um, so, so there's absolutely just the benefit of two people creating more wealth than just one person through through um, specialization and division of labor, right? Um, but then take that to the furthest extreme, which economists like to you know put up goalposts and go to the fur the furthest extreme is a uh, an individual walks into a crowded uh, uh, market in Jerusalem with a backpack full of explosives and detonates it and kills himself and, you know, a hundred innocent people around him. So you've got this fundamental human nature and the propensity to truck barter and exchange and be better off. And you've got suicide terrorism. It's like, how do we reconcile all yeah. of this? If these are extremes of human behavior. And I think economics gives us the tools to think about and and address those questions. I don't think that anything is easy, but I think that's a much better approach to understanding violence than is saying, well, that was a Muslim that blew himself up and we know things well, about Muslims. That's just, you know, that's just not the right way to address things. But the standard, I would say the standard way that economists often think about this problem, uh, First, of course, there is an economics approach to religion. Larry Coney, who I know yes. you know, you reference him in the book, yeah. uh, who's been a guest on the program, uh, talks about that. We, we may get to that. But the the more narrow way to think about economics in that setting is, okay, you've got a group of people who are truck bartering and changing, shopping in the market peacefully, respecting each other's property rights, uh, enforced by a set of police and, and government, and also norms uh, of how to interact. Then you have a, a terrorist, a murderer who's who disrupts that and kills a bunch of people. A lot of people would say, well, you know, that person who the economist approach to the terrorist could be, oh, well, that person didn't have many prospects in life. They didn't have much to live for. They had a better labor market where they were, uh, if they had been more opportunity, if Israel could trade, which they are now starting to do more of with their neighbors, uh, there's a better chance that those kind of things won't happen. And I think that's true. I think that's a good way to think about it. I'm, but I don't know what it, I, I don't, right? You can go to one extreme and say the terrorist is is just an economics standard of living problem. You just get, got to give them better choices. Or you could say, oh, they've got this destructive ideology that, that uh, they believe in and that harms us. Um, why? It seems to me it's both. So why do you want to focus on one over the other? I don't. I don't see it as one over the other. I think that that as economists we can acknowledge that religion provide it, religion provides institutional rules and constraints on human behavior. So, uh, being Jewish, being uh, Muslim, being Christian, being whatever. Um, is going to constrain behavior. And it's okay to acknowledge that. Um, I think where we go wrong is when we oversimplify the world to say all Jews are this, all Muslims are this, all Christians are this, all Mexicans are this, all Colombians are this, all Americans are this. And I think we do that. I think we unintentionally go too far with these identity labels. And I think it's 
appropriate that we pull back and say, well, maybe we've gone too far with identity labels and think about, think about the, the role of religion. So it's not, as I say in the book, it's not Islam as Islam that matters. It's Islam as an institution which, which, which shapes human behavior that does matter. And if we think about it that way, we can bring religion back into the dis- discussion. And I love Larry Iannacone's work and, and, and love to incorporate his, his ideas into this. So I'm not saying religion doesn't matter. I'm saying it doesn't matter in the way people think it matters. The part that I love that you emphasize is the, the kinship part Yes. And the 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 argument that a lot of what we're calling uh, terrorists or insurgents or criminals are providing something else that is masked by their the things that are costly to us as the non participants uh, the terror the death uh, the right. the um, the activities and and that that the opportunity to affiliate with these groups gives participants a actually a, a way to truck barter and exchange more effectively because they can trust their insiders. There's a role for loyalty there. So that I thought was was the most provocative idea in the book. Why, why don't you expand on that? Sure. I, so we I think I think we have this tendency to divide divide the world into us versus them, and we we do this regularly, whether we're aware of it or not. Um, and so this idea of kinship is actually um, you know somewhat pervasive in economic literature. There's you know Hirschleifer addresses it. You know there's uh, kinships and fictive kinships, and um, um, and explain and it, what you mean by that because that's important. What what is so kinship is you're my cousin, but right. what's a fictive kinship? What do you a mean fi- by that? A fictive kinship is it's it's not an actual blood uh, kinship or a blood relationship, but it um, it we have the 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 psychological construct of some sort of a familial tie. So we see this in the crime world we see this in mafias for example so if you if you study the the literature on mafias or if you just watch a good you know godfather uh the the godfather or another you know movie uh or read a novel the language is all about family there's a crime family there are the five families of um of the five crime families of new york so it's all family it's all brother um it's uh, your your loyalty to your um, your brother in the in the crime family actually supersedes your loyalty to your blood brother. So this is you know the Cosa Nostra story. Um, so we're we're somewhat as humans we're really susceptible to this to this idea of fictive kinships, and we do it all of the time. Um, uh, there's literature about you know the military creates these fictive. Uh, kinship. So when you go to war and you go to battle, and, and again, I started my career in the military in a war, um, you develop very, very strong bonds with these folks you go into battle with that really rival any other blood relationships that you have. Um, and so I think everybody can think about these kind of kinships. It can be as simple as you know, this weekend, um, you know, I'm rooting for the Washington football team, Russ, and you might be rooting for, you know, the Baltimore Ravens. I don't, I don't know. But, never, never, but <laughs> never. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to offend. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, but we develop we develop kinships around things like sports teams that we root for. So these are these I think are um, really important traits, human traits that are probably correlated with survival, the long term survival of our species. Um, but they're they're present today, and so we we do this. We can assume others do this, and it allows us to build trust. Trust allows us to engage in trade, right? It's hard to imagine trade in the absence of trust. I think markets require trust. Trust comes about through lots of different ways, uh, rules and enforcement, um, and contract law and courts is one way, but. Kinship or fictive kinship is another way in which we build trust. And if you're in the illicit economy, Russ, if you and I were drug dealers and I wanted you to manage my books, 
if you stole from me, I couldn't sue you. I can't bring you to court because we're drug dealers. So how do I overcome trust, the, the, the trust hurdle? Well, if you were a cousin of mine, I might actually let you manage my books because you're less likely to, to defect on me. And if you're not my real cousin, I am going to get to know you and your family and have you over to my house to meet my family. And I'm going to create a fictive kinship with you because that's a way to build trust and to deter defection. And if I miss, if I betray that trust, you're going to kill me and maybe my family that's members. That's true. Uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I, just, I mean, it was a nice dinner. I enjoyed it. Yes. Um, but the, um, I, I'm going to step back now and try to, and, and this is the way that I see your story and, and I'll yeah. let you uh, correct me or, or add to it. We have certain illegal activities uh, that there's still a big demand for, drugs being the most obvious example. Uh, people who provide those take risks, but they can make a lot of money. Uh, to create the networks of, that would a firm would have to have in a legal economy is going to require substitutes for the ways that people would normally interact. Uh, the threat of violence, as you just mentioned, would be one of those ways. And so these organizations that are violent, doing illegal things, uh, and sometimes offering an ideology or uh, a salvation uh, theme alongside all that, it's all the same package. It's just a way that an entrepreneur at the top of this organization can can have great success. And you paint both Pablo Escobar and Osama bin Laden as entrepreneurs and Joseph Kony as, as entrepreneurs who aimed high. Uh, the only problem I have with the story is that they both died terrible deaths of, of, of um, and fairly young. Uh, you know, not not totally young, but so the the challenge I think of making this a so-called rational enterprise is um, it usually doesn't it usually ends in a hail of gunfire. So you could argue that it's worth it along the way they get enough you know benefits. But these are people who have chosen a, a very dark niche to express themselves. Your point, I think, which is profound, is that but they are expressing themselves. That that is really. It's a form of self-actualization. It might be one that you and I would find unappealing, but for them, it was just, this, it's the same. It's not much different than, you know, I won't name anybody to compare him to Osama bin Laden or, <laughs> or Pablo Escobar, but some, think of your favorite CEO of a, of a legitimate firm right. who, who's, who's been successful. They become, these people become rich. They become famous and they have a lot of love from right. their adherents. Is that a good summary of what you're, you're selling here? Yeah, absolutely. That's um, uh, to the extent that I'm selling a story. I guess yes. That's oh, of course that's you a, are. <laughs> that's a summary. Um, that's a summary. Uh, it's a very good summary. You know the the myth of of Pablo Escobar is that when um, when he was tell a, us a little bit about him because many people, many people may not have heard of him know who he is. So give so, a little background. So so Pablo Escobar was the uh, was the head of the Medellin cartel, and he is largely considered the first narco terrorist. So the word narco terrorist, you know, was really first used in the popular vernacular describing Pablo Escobar, Colombian. Um, and there's this story about. Uh, Pablo Escobar getting his photo taken in front of the White House here on Pennsylvania Avenue, um, saying that he's going to negotiate with the president of the United States one day. So he, um, I don't know, I don't know his heart. I don't know what he really wanted, but at least that's part of the mythology of Pablo, which he had very grand political ambitions. He started out um, as a is a street level thug. He, you know, stole cars and, and sold, um, you know, sold the goods of his proceeds. And then he figured out that he could make more money by, um, by protecting other people's cars. So the classic protection racket, which is you start out doing something, some criminal activity, and then you realize you can make more money by protecting people from yourself, from that very same criminal activity. So this is Pablo. I mean, this, yeah, this is, um, this is Pablo Escobar. So he he uh, becomes uh, he runs a protection racket, and then he kind of stumbles into um, smuggling things across borders, which is another form of protection. Um, 
uh, plato or plomo, which is uh, uh, lead or silver. Basically, if you are a Colombian police officer or a, a an enforcement official of some sort and you run into Pablo, you have a choice. He's going to give you silver, and if you don't, he's going to give you money, and if you don't take it, he's going to shoot you. So, so he he became popular for for you know silver or lead when you meet when you when you see him. Um, and then he just happened to be kind of at the right place at the right time, which is the United States discovers its love for cocaine and uh, cocaine production moves into Colombia. And so this is a guy who's got well-established smuggling routes. He's got um, massive numbers of police, military, law enforcement, and judges in Colombia on his payroll anyways. And now he can make orders of magnitude more money by smuggling and by paying off government officials because he's now smuggling cocaine into Miami. And that's where he really becomes wealthy and famous. Inside of, and I think it's important, in Medellin, which is his hometown, he actually does become, you know, he, he's, the, he's the FBI's most wanted criminal and he walks in broad daylight through the streets of Medellin. He's not in hiding because the people, the whole town of Medellin loves and supports him. He builds roads, schools, hospitals. Um, he provides that um, social safety net uh, that the government is unable to do because he's actually got more money than the government. So this is, this is Pablo Escobar. So um, yes, he dies um, with a bullet to the head by um, law enforcement agents eventually. It took a long but, time. But it took a long time and uh, look at today, we're still talking about him. I mean, I don't know, Russ, if he didn't win the game in a sense, right? Did he really not get what he wanted? Well, my favorite part of your book, one of my favorite parts is where he's in prison, yes. li living <laughs> like a king. Uh, not not much different from uh, some of the stories that David Scarbeck tells. You reference right. David's work, who was on the program, of how drug dealers in American prisons extend their reach back into their home neighborhoods through Confederates, friends, loyal lieutenants, and so on, demand things of people when they're released from prison, which are enforced through the threat of violence, which is really an important part part of this. I want to I want to hear though why why he builds these schools and and of course terrorist organizations. Again, I think one of the things that's useful about your framework is that it's, it should be blurred, the line between yes. terrorists, social providers, and and um, social service providers, because they, they often do all these. They also all sell illicit things. They raise money through right. illicit things, illegal things. They provide services to nearby citizens, and they also carry on some ideological political goals. So it's kind of a – another way to think about it, sort of a shadow – a shadow government in a, in a certain dimension in these places where formal governments are weak. But what's the gain to an Escobar of those schools? Now, he gets the adulation of the people around him, but he, I guess he also gets the protection. Is that part of the motive there? Yeah, sure. So the again, loyalty? just think about Escobar and, and, um, and, uh, and Osama bin Laden is – entrepreneurs, they need a safe haven from which to operate. And so they provide social services and social benefits, which increases loyalty and deters defection. It's that simple. Um, Ellie Berman, uh, whose who's work I'm sure you know, he writes about this where he looked at the uh, terrorist groups in um, committing acts of terrorism in Israel and the groups, uh, Hamas um, is the top of the list, uh, engages in more deadly acts of violence, and they also provide more social services. And so the point he makes is, is that it's by providing social services, you create the, you know, the club. So you have a club goods model is what Ellie does with it. Um, and so you encourage loyalty, you deter affection, and your ability to engage in high value illicit activities is a function of your ability to deter defection. If you cannot deter defection, you cannot engage in high value criminal activity. And so Pablo Escobar gets a safe haven. He gets the entire city to operate from by providing public services and public goods to all of the people. So it might feed his ego. Again, I don't know his heart and soul, but it, it might make him feel good to walk down the streets and, and be hailed as a hero. 
but it also allows him the freedom to operate a global criminal enterprise um, without, you know, with a nice quality of life in which he's not really hiding or on the run. And, and um, it's, it's actually it seems like a pretty rational and smart thing to do. So violence plays an unusual role in these stories that I think goes beyond. Um, it's a special kind of incentive effect that I think maybe is underappreciated. I always talk about how, you know, survey results in places where violence is is casual and normal or uninformative, those survey results, because people are afraid to tell the truth. Right. Um, you tell the story, uh, horrifying, horrifying story where Escobar uh, bound a ser- tied up a servant of his, uh, threw him into a swimming pool and watched him drown in front of his guests so he could announce this is what happens to those who steal from Pablo Escobar. I'm reminded of the group, I can't remember now who it was, when the British were in... Uh, uh, in India, they uh, somebody I can't remember who it was now. They found three men sleeping. Uh, they would they would behead two of them and leave the third one to wake up to spread the word because that person is more effective than three dead people. A person who's who survived that then tells right. folks, and right. it reminded me strangely because I'm strange, but it reminded me of 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 Solzhenitsyn and and uh, Vasily Grossman who write about how a person in a situation of violence and and corruption and degradation who chooses to stay undegraded, refuses to advance their own self-interest because of what they understand it will do to their sense of self. And they both men honor the people who in the gulag refuse to advance themselves at the expense of others. And Economics says you should. Economics often, I think bad economics, but economics will say, well, the rational thing is to be violent. The rational thing is to raise the cost. The rational thing is to, is to, is to in a zero-sum game, make sure you get ahead, not behind. And I, I think there's a, a question of, of um, principles, morals, self, I don't know what you want to call it. Economics doesn't have much to say about it, but it seems to me once violence is on the table, the normal ways that we think about our self-interest and incentives get get ratcheted up so high that that they kind of overwhelm everything else. You know, it's like saying to someone, "Oh, you know, don't you know, don't worry about betraying Pablo Escobar. We'll pay you enough money to make it worth your while." Well, there probably isn't enough money for most people because they'll do some things to you that that aren't worth any amount of money that you could imagine. Maybe. Yeah. So I think two two uh, ideas in what you just said that I want to respond to. The the first is, I think the the iron rule of autocracy is is very simple. It's this message: if you challenge me, you will lose, and I will win. Yeah. I think that's like that's that's just it. That's the rule. So that's the you goal. Yeah. you apply that anywhere in history, anywhere in the world, at any time in history, anywhere in the world. And the successful autocrat, and the autocrat can be the, the leader of a drug gang in your neighborhood, or it could be, you know, the, the leader of a political party, um, you know, in a de- democratic country. But if you're the leader, what you want to convey is, if you challenge me, you will lose and I will win. Um, so how do you go about doing that? Um, well, if you're, if you're Pablo Escobar, um, if you're any sort of... Um, criminal, you need to, back to the idea of you're, if you're running the books for our drug gang, I'm going to have you and your family over for dinner, but you, but I need to let you know that if you challenge me, you're going to lose it and I'm going to win. And I think that's a universal rule. Like and you read any novel of fiction, any real life story, and you're going to see a variation on that thing play out. Um, so, so I, that's, that's my first response. The second is that I think when when economists talk about value, we have to define the word more broadly than um, agreed than something that can be um, reduced to a dollar value, um, you know, a monetary value. So in the in the story that you tell, and I'm not familiar with that literature, I've heard you talk about it a couple times now, though, is um, you know, um, self esteem, like my I. I have, for whatever reason, 
um, and this could be the introduction of culture, religion, other things, but I've got some sort of moral code that I live by and I find value in not deviating from that code. That's a very rational thing. Economists should be able to account for that pretty, pretty simply. Yeah, they they struggle with it though. I think um, yes. sometimes it's not. Um, yes. It doesn't. It's easy. It's hard to measure and hard yes. to put in the equations. Is, is part of it. Uh, we, you know, we mentioned fiction earlier. The Wire is one of my favorite shows, and um, at least I saw the first couple seasons, two yes. or three. I can't remember now, but uh, it, the first season opens is about the the drug war and the yeah. Baltimore police at war with yeah. the the drug dealers on the streets of Baltimore. And the reason I think it's a powerful film, powerful series, and I think, you know, David Simon, who created it, has some deep insights, is that there's kind of a dance between both sides that we are often uh, ignored or peril, which is that the police do want to catch the drug dealers, but they also profit from the drug dealers being out there as a source of reason for them to exist, have big budgets, and so on. Uh, and... I, I wonder how much people really want to catch Pablo Escobar, especially in, in Colombia. First of all, he, you know, he killed tons of uh, judges and, and people who would normally be uh, against him. Nominally, governments are supposed to stop drug dealers. It's not really my um, I always you know, I wonder whether they should. <laughs> it's not it doesn't seem to make much difference. It um, all it does is uh I know we spend a lot of money chasing them around and it uh, doesn't seem to have a big impact on the amount of drugs. Maybe it reduces it to what it would otherwise be. It's possible. Uh, but the costs are very, very high. But it, when I think about a, a less organized uh, government situation, say, in a poorer country than the United States, I mean, how badly do those folks really want to? I mean, is, is Pablo Escobar an enemy for them? I, I mean, I'm not sure he's an enemy in the United States either, but, you know, we have these narratives, also a different form of fiction. We have these narratives about, you know, the that these people are our enemy. Pablo Escobar is providing a service. It's a destructive service, cocaine, but you know, is in, in a certain way. But it's what people wanted, and uh, we his his government maybe pretended to to try to stop him. I don't know. It could be part of the. And when they tried to stop him, he killed them. <laughs> so uh, the combination of of uh, ineffective governance there, uh, you know, creates a very strange dynamic between the two sides. It seems to me. So if you, we have an agency problem in the sense that some politicians have different goals than some police officers might have. And so we have to, we have to disaggregate the, the decision-making process and the preferences and the optimization functions of the different individuals and players involved. But in, in general, what you see, if you look across, across crime insurgency, terrorism, across countries and cultures and religions around the world and throughout history, you see that there's there tends to be a threshold below which politicians don't care and above which the politicians get involved. So when Pablo Escobar was um, smuggling drugs into the United States, um, he wasn't really a priority inside of Colombia until a, uh, a prosecutor decides that he thinks it's starting to have a corrupting influence. And so then Pablo kills the prosecutor and then Pablo starts to kill um, other politicians and bombs start blowing up in, in town. And so now it becomes a political priority to actually go after Pablo. But before that, when he was just selling drugs into the United States, they kind of left him alone. And back to the point you raised earlier, where eventually they built a prison for, for the Medellin cartel. And they said, you know, you all move into the prison uh, and stop blowing things up. And then we're going to leave you alone. And so they actually ran the Medellin cartel from inside of the prison. The, the barbed wire faced out, meaning they had a safe haven in which they didn't want anybody to come in. The politicians got what they wanted, which is a decrease in violence. They didn't care about the drugs leaving Colombia going to the United States. They just didn't want Colombian, uh, to Colombian innocent people getting killed. Um, that's a common theme. The, the, um, the Cosa Nostra, the, the uh, Sicilian mafia in Sicily, operated for 150 years just fine. They did great. And then there were mafia wars in which prosecutors and judges started to get, kill, to get killed. And then public opinion turned against them. So it didn't matter at that point how many hospitals, roads, and bridges you built. 
as a drug dealer, once you're killing judges and politicians, public opinion could turn against you. So, so politicians, there tends to be a threshold at which uh, violence is a nuisance versus violence is a, is a national priority. Um, Mexican elections have, have uh, gone back and forth over the last 20 years based upon if we crack down on the drug dealers, that's good, but violence increases. If we don't crack down on the drug dealers, they make more money, but violence drops. Right. And so, poli- so, um, so and then they face the external pressure from the United States, say, to do something about it. And that, those right. that incentive also plays. Right. Which is today's, today's news and headlines is, is that um, in the wire. And I love I love the wire. I'm I'm on the the bandwagon of best TV show ever. I'm in I'm in that group. Top five um, for me. Yeah. Um, what I love about it is, is, is it does exactly what I'm trying to do in my book, which is it blurs the lines. The, the, yeah. the, the drug dealers are bad guys and the cops are good guys. Well, it doesn't come out that way in The Wire. Yeah. It turns out that life is more complicated and humans are more complicated. And if we, if we take the, 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 the firms, entrepreneurs, and markets discussion into The Wire, it actually makes sense. So it's not, let's not label people as cops are good, drug dealers are bad. Let's look at firms, institutions, markets, and incentives. And now you can really understand why people are behaving the way they're behaving. And that's a much more clear and and enlightening way to look at the world, I believe. So I agree. I agree with that up to a point. Obviously, I agree with it because I think incentives matter. And I think markets produce outcomes that uh, no individual intends and that are just the reality that we need to think about. You can't just change that. You can't, you know, the idea of that you could uh, make something illegal and therefore solve it is um, a, a really important. Th- Actually, that's so obviously true to an economist and so obviously not true to most people that maybe we should spend a little bit of time on it because I think most people think, well, if something's bad, we just make it against the law without thinking about what or make something, you know, subsidize something that we think is good as if that solves you know a problem uh, it often leads to a set of, of more complicated uh, things but you know when we think about when we think about the wire uh, I, I think your approach of thinking you know the drug dealers are on, they're running a business we don't like to think of it maybe that way you and I do but most people don't I mean, that's kind of weird what do you mean they're running a business they have employees they have labor issues they have price issues they have competition right. and of course all of that because the courts cannot be used, they have to find alternative ways to deal with defection, disloyalty, unpleasant outcomes that which didn't happen. And so as a result, you get violence as a way as a way to deal with that. We we didn't mention you didn't mention, but your book does. At one point, Pablo Escobar shoots, takes down an airliner, a quote, terrorist act. And so he's a drug dealer. He's got political ambition, which we didn't talk about. So, you know, what is he? Is he an insurgent, a terrorist, or drug dealer? He's all three. And it's your point is, which is I think profound, is that it's not obvious uh, that it's useful to describe him as, say, a criminal. Uh, he is a criminal, but if we think of him as only a criminal, we don't hit the full story. The challenge I have for you is that when we think about ways to reduce these things, if that's an ideal, it's not obvious how to leverage this under richer understanding. So I have, I agree with you, certainly as an economist, that that understanding the incentives, institutions, norms, uh, uh, values that, that folks have, r- choices that people face, helps us understand more accurately what's going on. But you also make the claim that it helps us fight it if we want to fight it. And I wasn't convinced by that. So I want to make, let you make the case now. You argue that this identity category idea of, you know, you, know, you argue that this is unproductive. Uh, why is it more productive? I agree it's more accurate to realize that that it, that there are all kinds of issues involved, ego, uh, alternatives, uh, ambition, and that, and that often these outcomes are a result of those more interesting forces than just say an ideological predilection. How does it help us, you know, do something about it if we want to? Wow. So there, it you can't take action and expect a desired outcome if you don't understand what's causing the 
you know, the situation to begin with. So it seems kind of obvious to me that we have to understand or at least attempt to understand causation if we want to try to bring about a different outcome. And I think the tools of economics really help us to do that. Um, uh, there's a large body of literature on radicalization and counter-radicalization, and some of my friends are involved in that. There are large uh, departments of the U.S. government working on it. Um, and I'm not sure it's a good idea. I'm not sure it's, uh, it's a good use of, of funds because... Um, but just the whole idea, just think about the world, the word radical. I mean, radical is a subjective word. It's not an objective word. I mean, I've got, you know, who doesn't have a radical uncle or something like that? I mean, it could mean so many different things. So if we want to do counter radicalization, it, it seems, I don't know, it just seems too squishy for me to, to really get my head around um, as, a, as, a, as a scientist, as an economist. Um, but things that do make sense are the things we've been talking about, which is, you know, how do I, how do I think about, um, about the, uh, the drug gang on the streets of Baltimore, um, as a business, I can make perfect sense of that. Um, I often ask my students to, to their, you know, great frustration, uh, if we need to care about motivation. If I see somebody running a drug gang in Baltimore or running a, a drug cartel in Colombia or running a terrorist organization in, 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 uh, in the United States or anywhere in the world, and I look at the leader, I look at that entrepreneur, do I need to know why they're doing it? Um, it might help to know why, but I don't know that I need to know why. And I think that's a good question for us to explore. Um, when we when we try to understand why we're getting into things like surveys and survey results and things like that, and people are, are misleading intentionally often. Um, if I know, however, that they need to generate revenues and minimize costs, and as long as revenues exceed costs and they can make payroll and they can deter defection, that they're going to stay in business. I don't need to know why they're selling drugs or they're blowing up airplanes. I just need, I know how I can help them to fail as a business. And it seems to me that's what I need to know. If I want to put a drug dealer out of business, I don't need to know what's in his heart or hers. I need to know how to get them to fail as a business. And but the way the way we've done that historically in the United States, we've tried to. We've I I would argue we've we've used economics. We've we've tried it's a really primitive form of it, and I think yours is a richer approach. But I'm going to let you take at, have at it. We've tried to raise the cost. You know, we, we say, look, you sell drugs on the street, you could go to jail. You could get you could get killed. Uh, we, we've tried to make it more expensive and less attractive, and I would say that has utterly failed, right? So, what's an alternative mm -hmm. approach? Another approach would be to create, you know, try to create more jobs in the neighborhood to make it harder for those folks to attract lieutenants and privates and people in their army to, right? You could try that approach. What else you got? Um, and by the way, the yeah. flip side of that in in the terrorist story is. In places with bad governance, you want more governance if you can find a right. way to get it there. It's hard right. to do because right. they're an alternative to that. And then ideally, you want more trade to raise the cost yeah. to me of of, of destructive, non-trade, non-cooperative activity. Does economics have anything more to say yeah. than that? So just uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that with uh, the three, three points that I make in the book. But before I do, in The Wire, uh, there's this wonderful character uh, named Stringer Bell. Stringer Bell is played by a young Idris Elba, who yeah. has gone on to Phenomenal. become one of the most famous, you know, and yeah. wonderful actors in the world. But Idris Elba is Stringer Bell, who actually, he's the deputy for the, the particular um, drug gang, the Barksdale gang in Baltimore in this uh, fictional account. And he goes um, to um, the local community college and he takes classes in economics uh, yeah. to help him run his drug organization better, which is just a a beautiful kind of cap on this idea that it's a business. They're running a business and Stringer Bell is asking questions about, you know, elasticity of demand yep. of the professor, right? I remember that scene. I think it's slightly <laughs> fictional in the sense I don't think taking economics helps you really that much become a better drug dealer, but I got the idea. Yeah. Right, right. Well, he's, he was, he's trying to figure out how to price his product in a competitive market, which is what entrepreneurs do. Yeah. Um, so so I, I suggest... 
my my idea here is let's understand a better way to look at phenomena in the world. Let's let's understand vi- uh, uh, crime insurgency and terrorism better, and not label it as crime insurgency and terrorism. But let's blur the line, uh, as you described that uh, that we do with Pablo Escobar. Um, so, but what can we really do about it? So, I have I have three ideas. First is let's analyze like business executives. So, if I'm looking at Al Qaeda or the Islamic State or the Sinaloa cartel, um, I'm going to treat them all the same. First of all, I'm going to look at them and I'm and I want to know um, if I were a, a venture capitalist that was thinking about investing in them, would they be a good investment? Would that firm be worthy of my investment dollars? Right? It's strange to think about the Islamic State and the Sinaloa cartel is. Um, is selling shares and raising money, but I think we should think about it as investors and do we believe in the business model? So uh, tell me about the leadership structure. Do I think the CEO and, and the CFO are good, you know, solid people? Uh, do they have a strong mission? Do they have, um, do, do they have product market fit? Are they selling a product that has um, elasticity of demand or not? Um, what are their competitors like? Is it a, is it a deep market? Um, do they have massive market share or only a portion of the market share? Um, what's their balance sheet look like? Do they have lots of money in the bank to get them through hard times or are they just getting by, you know, month to month? Um, how do they recruit? How do they retain? What's their defection constraint? What's their turnover rate? How, how often, what percentage of their employee base turns over every year? These are really standard business questions that any investor would ask of, of any, um, potential investment, we should be asking these questions of these uh, firms that we're trying to defeat. These are good, solid questions. Second is, is we want to define victory in market terms. So when, you know, over the last 15 years, we've been fighting wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. I've been very close in, in, in some years, more, more close in some years than others to this. And um, I think we, we got victory wrong. Victory is not um, you know, signing a peace treaty uh, and walking away. I don't know that victory ever was that, but it's definitely not that now. Um, uh, killing the leader, right? Is, that doesn't really bring about victory in, in market terms. You know, if you're, if you're Coke versus Pepsi or, or um, you know, IBM versus, you know, Cisco or whatever, you know, you don't think about taking out the leadership. You'd think about taking market share. So once we've done the analysis of these firms, we have to think about us as a rival firm to them or our allies as rival firms to them, and we want to take market share from them. Taking market share could mean kill the leader, but it doesn't always mean kill the leader, right? Sometimes that is productive. Sometimes that's not productive in in the context of violence and warfare. We have to think about what is how do we win in the marketplace in which this firm operates, in which the Sinaloa cartel and the Islamic State operate? How do we, how do we defeat them as a rival firm? So we have to define victory properly. And then the third thing is uh, we have to fight like an entrepreneur. So we have to think about the ways in which we would go to market. Um, when we think about going to market, uh, in drug dealing, we think about the DEA. When we think about counterterrorism, we think about the DOD. Um, it seems to me that that's an um, a overly narrow and focused view of how we're supposed to be a market participant. So we, the United States or, and or our friends and allies around the world, should think of, think of ourselves as firms in markets and let's go to war as a firm would um, in this context. So how do we, how do we um, diminish the ability to recruit? How do we encourage defections? How do we deplete resources that they might have in banks? I think we do a lot of these things piecemeal and case by case, but I think we should think more holistically as a firm competing against a firm in a competitive marketplace. And that's really fundamentally, Russ, what I'm arguing is if we think about if we think about terrorism as a function of Islam and drug dealing as a function of, you know, Mexican and right. Colombian, yeah, right, whatever, um, I think we're missing out on the fact that markets, firms, entrepreneurs are really the key ideas for, for making a difference in the world. Let's talk for a second uh, about taking out leadership. Uh, 
sometimes in the case of, of say, a mafia war, the person who does the killing wants the other side to know who did it. Uh, there's a tribal kinship thing for their own side. They, they avenge something sometimes. But sometimes you don't want the people to know who did it. And right. no one takes credit for some of these deaths. And they, you know, one of the, one of the things your book taught me is that the virtue of that is it it widens the range of possible enemies you might have that you're not aware right. of, which spreads you thin. That's a way that you make a firm less effective. The part I think that that is effective that I wonder if you underplay, though, is the talent is scarce. And if you take out a leader, it's not it's true that that leader will be replaced, but presumably that leader will not be as talented. And there's also the that the competition for that role is diminished when you know that you can be killed. So it's a way of turning the violence against that group that they've been imposing on other people. Do you think that's a legitimate way to think about it? I think that's a simplistic way to think about it. I think that's true sometimes, but I think I think it's worthwhile to take a step back and ask if that's the if that's the case all of the time. Uh, two two examples. First, um, Steve Levitt. And um, so in Levitt and Venkatesh, they did a paper on the drug wars in Chicago where they actually got the, the, the books and the payroll. Uh, and they asked this question about, you know, if, if, if gang wars are bad for revenue, right, decrease revenue, increase costs, why do we see violence across gangs? And one of their conclusions of their, I think, very interesting paper is that it's a... Um, uh, it's it's a it's a um, it's a competition. It's a lottery. It's like if if you're street level, you could make more money working at Home Depot than street level in the drug gang. But if you go get the the minimum wage job, you'll never make a lot of money. But if you enter the drug gang, right. um, and if enough people above you get killed, and if you survive, um, you might actually make a lot of money one day, right? So like it's a that. it's a tournament. Um, it's a tournament is, is th that idea. Second example is we worked for years, we, the United States worked for years to help the Colombians get rid of Pablo Escobar. And what happened the day we got rid of Pablo Escobar is the, the, uh, Cali cartel stepped in the mark. We didn't change the market, Russ. We just killed an entrepreneur right. and the Cali cartel was probably very supportive of our efforts to defeat the head oh, of the yeah. Medellin cartel because they just took over the market. Um, so I think anecdotally, I, you, could pro you could come up with cases in which getting rid of the leader made a difference, and you could cut up, come up with instances in which getting rid of the leader doesn't make a difference, which is why I argue you have to, you have to think like a business person, fight like an entrepreneur, and you have to ask yourself, that rival firm that CEO is super valuable, and if we get rid of him, it's likely to harm the, the operations of the firm, or that CEO is surrounded by a talented bench, and that CEO is really not material to our ability to defeat the firm. And I think we have to ask those kinds of questions. My guest today has been Gary Schiffman. His book is The Economics of Violence. Gary, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Russ loved it. Thanks very much. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.